Okay, thank you very much. So it is the time, so we are going to start with the webinar. So first of all, I want to thank you all for joining us today and welcome you to this webinar, which is part of the third series of webinars organized by the Climate Europe Project. This webinar is specifically focused on climate services for the energy sector. So we will be presenting the experiences from three different H2020 projects, S2S4E, uh, Primavera and Applicate, and we will present various ways of sharing knowledge through the use of case studies. Most of you probably know Climate Europe, but for those who don't know it, uh, it is a coordination and support action funded by the European Commission to bring together the European climate services communities. In this sense, it has been building a network to put together users, providers, and stakeholders in the field of climate services and air system modeling. First, I'd like to introduce myself. So my name is Isadora Jimenez. I'm science communication expert uh, at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and I lead the knowledge transfer team in the Earth Science Department. And today I will be moderating this webinar. Uh, first, let me tell you a few technical aspects. So first of all, uh, I want to inform you that this webinar will be recorded, and later it will be shared online. Then for all of you, please, Make sure your microphone is muted and your camera is switched off during the entire webinar, except for the speakers. And uh, over the webinar, you can ask or write questions. Please use the chat box to make questions if possible. And uh, you will be able to write a question at any time. And after the speaker's presentation, we are going to select some of your questions and we will ask them to the, to the speakers. Uh, so I think we are fine. Everybody, everybody is here. So we're going to start introducing the speakers. So we're going to start the webinar with presentations for the three speakers. After each presentation, there will be a last round of 10 minutes for a general discussion. And uh, for sure, all comments and, uh, and opinions are really welcome in this last part of the webinar. Uh, so I don't to introduce the first speaker. Uh, her name is Carla Hernandez. She's project manager at Energic, which is a small medium enterprise that works on weather analytics in the energy sector. She will be presenting the experience with energy case studies for the S2S4E project. So now we're going to give Carla the center right so she can share her uh, slides, and uh, then we will start. Thank you. Could you please let me know if you can uh, see my screen? Can you, can you uh, see my screen now? No? No. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Any wonder? Yes, uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, we can see this. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> so you can go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um I don't know also if you can if you can see me. Hopefully. I hope you, you you can see me as well. Well, thank you, Isa, for the introduction. Thank you, Climate Europe, for the invitation to participate in this webinar. Um, well, as, as uh, Isadora said, I'm Carla Hernandez. I'm project manager at Energix Energy Management. I'm also a PhD candidate in business and entrepreneurship in the University of Barcelona. A little bit about uh, the company Energix. Energix is a uh, SME, as Lisa said. Um, it's a technological-based uh, company. It has six years in the renewable energy industry, and our business is to provide weather and energy forecasting services and data analytics to the to the industry. So now we are one of the 12 partners in the S2S4E project consortium. 
And well, today I'm here, I'm glad to be here to talk about uh, sharing knowledge through case studies within the context of the S2S4E project. So uh, this is the content that I will be sharing with you today. Uh, I will start with the objectives of the, of the presentation. I will talk a lot about a little bit of the S2S4E project and the de decision support tool that we are developing. Um, of course, everyone that doesn't know really know about the project. Uh, also, I will start by asking why do we need to elaborate case studies in general and how do we need these case studies within the context of the project, of the s 2 s 3 project. I will share with you one example of a case study, the, the development uh, of it uh, in the project. And finally, I will bring you some main challenge that we have to 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 meet and the key learnings from uh, doing these case studies in, in the project. And then finally, we will have, I think, the uh, when we finalize all the presentation, the answers, the question and answers uh, session. So these are the two objectives that I would like to, 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 to meet today with you. The first one is to understand why developing case studies is relevant before during and after the development of the S2S4E project, because um, I will I will explain it uh, a little bit further. But this this project is special because it's oriented, it's market oriented. So uh, case studies uh, will be used are used uh, in different stages of the development of the project. But I will go there uh, in a little bit more. And uh, the second one is identify how can we use these case studies with potential users when, once the, the project is finished. Uh, about the S2S for e project. Uh, the main objective of the S2S for e project is to make the uh, Europe, uh, European Union uh, energy sector more resilient to climate variability. Um, the project is subsistence to seasonal climate forecasting for energy. It's a three-year project uh, funded by the European Union uh, Horizon 2020 program for research and innovation action. This means that it has to be something else when finalizing the, the project. Uh, the consortium is led by the Barcelona Supercomputer Center. We are 12 partners uh, in the in the project. And there are um, European research centers in the team, energy companies, SME as, as energies, and also there's a consultancy firm. Um, so how uh, the project will uh, meet this objective or make more resilient uh, the, the energy sector uh, to climate variability by bringing one, one tool, one product, a final product to the market and new decision support to, that it's based on subseasonal to seasonal climate predictions uh, to bring forecasts for energy for energy variables and demand variables to the energy industry players. So uh, this uh, decision support tool could be very, very helpful uh, to these energy players to better manage their assets and their risks in, in their assets. Um, the decision support tool is now um, available, free available. Uh, the launch, the, the formal launch was last week during the European Sustainable Week. And here you have the, the link if you want to try the beta version of, of the decision support tool. This is a screenshot screenshot of the decision support tool. Once again, if you want to try it, you are free to use. You only have to register, and that's it. It's very nice. You can play a lot of it. <laughs> so why do we need to elaborate case studies? Uh, this is in general. In the research uh, or industry um, in general, case studies are widely used for different reasons. It can be for building credibility about uh, your product or your research or for research motivation or justification or to evaluate effectiveness of your research or your product or 
uh, also for theory development, this is in, in literature and research also, or for having in-depth knowledge for certain things. Or uh, in the industry, it can, it's a very powerful tool for marketing and sales. So uh, I like uh, this phrase from uh, a paper by Siegel Paul named Persuasion with Case Study. In his paper, he suggested that uh, unique case studies is like having a blue goldfish. It's unique, it's, it's valuable. So it can be powerful tools to persuade and convince others that your argument or your product or your research or what, whatever you have is important, unique, valuable, and useful. Uh, for example, if you could read the, the invitation for this webinar, there's a phrase that says that case studies can help showcase how climate information and knowledge uh, will have been useful at the moment of the event. Um, in short, <laughs> in other words, we are persuading you and we mean to persuade users, combine, we mean to com combine users that we have useful, useful tools that can help them to manage their business risks. Okay? So that's in general. But in the context of the project, why do we need case studies? Uh, and I would like to, to, to separate the why in three stages of the project. Why do we need case studies before we execute the project, during the, ex the execution of the project, and after the execution of the project? Okay? Before the execution of the project, we need study cases to identify gaps in climate services. That actually, I think that this one is one of the uh, objectives of Climate Europe, for instance. Uh, also, we need uh, uh, case studies to demonstrate the potential in our case of the of the forecast used in the DST for energy players. And finally, uh, it's important to convince financial entities that what we are planning is relevant and useful for the energy sector for justification. And during the project, once we, we started with it, we need to continue working on these uh, case studies because we need to identify the added value of the DST to decision-making uh, players for the energy sector. Why? Because as I said, uh, the particularity of this project is that it's aimed to be commercialized, uh, to, to have a final product to be commercialized uh, in the energy sector and maybe in other sectors. So this is why we, we, we need to have a solid uh, case studies because after the project is done, we need to build credibility and trust during the commercialization, commercialization process, okay? Um, this uh, in the bottom of the of this slide, uh, there are some deliverables that actually uh, explains and use this case study in different in these different stages of the of the project. So you can go there are public and read uh, how do we analyze these different case studies during uh, the project. Okay. So, uh, how was the application of the S2S4 project? Well, this is a methodology that we followed. It's very near from the uh, literature research, uh, you know, process. This is um, uh, the methodology of um, Robert Jean. So we followed something very similar to, to what he suggested. We made eight in-depth interviews uh, in the design phase uh, with uh, eight different companies from the sector that uh, all of them uh, considered or, or use S2S uh, information and time scales in their decisions. Then in the prepare phase, uh, we developed an interview guide a narrative and a structure to, to, for the interviews. And then we collected the information in the in-depth interviews. Then we analyzed the, the information okay. and shared the information in three deliverables. I don't know, someone is not in mute and I can hear myself. I don't know, I'm putting mute, please. <laughs> 
And finally, uh, it's important to say that this is an iterative process. It doesn't finish once uh, in one round of interviews, but it's iterative. You have to continue talking with the users because uh, that's how you can have a very good in-depth um, uh, research and case. So this is case study seven. I cannot go very, very in-depth of that case because I think I, I am 11 minutes now. But it's interesting that this this case study was suggested for um, one participant from the trading energy sector. He recalled this 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 case because uh, from him, for, uh, this study this case was from uh, was a cold spell, a very very um, heavy cold spell that happened in in Europe, particularly in center. Of Europe, in France, and Europe, uh, in February and March 2018. Uh, he this this uh, the name of this cold wave was the beast from the east. I don't know if you could uh, see it in the news. So you can remember that. But this energy trading uh, participant uh, recalled it behind the repercussions in energy demand and transmission they have. In, 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 the, in that occasion. He also recalled that those days the European, they had gas prices uh, increased up to 100% and have been a major driver for power market prices. So um, when, now that uh, we have the, ah, sorry. Hi, this is important. Hi, this is Carla. Uh, just uh, to let you know that you have two more minutes to finish. And uh, okay. so you have to go fast. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this is how we developed the the case study. We we decide to analyze this phenomena in in the context of power trading. So what we made is to have some simulation with the with the forecast of the DST and the uh, trading prices, energy prices, and our results show that from the analysis of these illustrative simulations, we could see that the demand um, that power traders could have uh, improved their uh, strategies by allowing, in this case, savings during the purchase of energy in this this study case. But once more, uh, if you go to the links that I shared to you in, in in previous slides, you can see and you can go further in the deliverable and you can read uh, this case study in depth. So how can you use it after uh, after um, this, uh, after the project is done? You can use this information to develop trustable arguments behind this case study because we can now uh, sell it to, to potential users. So what are the main challenges and key learnings from this from from the development of case studies during this project. Uh, this some of th these challenges, the data availability. There's many times there's no data or the data is confidential. So you have to, to make a lot of research from different sources. Also the information confidentiality, maybe uh, you can use them, but you cannot share them. So you can look the way to share, but without uh, violating this information confidentiality or different profiles in the user. So you have to manage these different profiles and learn from them also. So this is the, the key learning that the initial interview with users is only the first step for developing a case study. However, it takes much more researcher, user work and collaboration to create a good, insightful and persuasive case study. In other words, a blue fish, a blue goldfish. So thank you very much uh, for your time. Thank you very much for everything and that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carla. Um, so now I'm gonna change it back again. So uh, it was interesting. Uh, so far we didn't have questions, so we are going to try to head with the next uh, speaker and then after the three talks uh, we can talk a bit more.
I remember to all the assistants, uh, uh, attendees, if you have any questions, you can uh, drop it in the chat box and I will be interested with it. So the next speaker is Marta Serrano. She's a science communication specialist in the Earth Science Department at BSC. She will present experience of the Applicate Project, which is a case study on the effects of the Arctic in mid latitudes in Europe, I guess. So go ahead, Marta. Okay, yeah, just one second, but I was trying to switch off the camera, but maybe just let me see if I can. No? Yeah. Wait. Can I? Yeah, okay. So, yeah, it's fine then. I will mention the screen now. Yes. So anyway, I'm going to start the presentation. In this uh, presentation, I will explain uh, the, the energy case study that we have developed in the Applicate project. And this energy case study was interesting because, because it also allowed us to understand the linkages between the Arctic and, and mid latitudes. Uh, this, uh, this case study uh, has been the work of, of many people from BSC and also from, from the Applicate project, especially. In a nutshell, the Applicate project uh, has two main objectives, let's say. First, to develop enhanced predictive capacity for weather and climate in the Arctic and beyond. And the second objective is to determine the influence that Arctic climate change uh, on, has on mid latitudes for the benefit of policymakers, businesses, and the society in general. Uh, at the bottom of this slide, you can see the, the logos of the different institutions that are participating in the Applicate project. In terms of, of user engagement, the Applicate project is uh, doing different kinds of activities. For example, we have a user group, which is uh, constituted by uh, different stakeholders in the Arctic and some in mid latitudes, but with interest in the Arctic. And the, the role of this user group is to advise the research that is being developed in the project. Also, we have a, a block, which is called Polar Prediction Matters. And, uh, this block uh, was launched in 2017 and is run by the Year of Polar Prediction Project with the collaboration of Applicate and also the Blue Action Project. The, the idea is that uh, this block is a kind of online forum where uh, a dialogue between forecasters and, and users of climate information is, is maintained. If you, if you visit it, you will see that there are different articles written by, by stakeholders and stating which are their needs regarding climate and also CI information. Uh, we also um, uh, run uh, training activities uh, to, to train, to prepare the next generation of uh, polar scientists. And in this regard, uh, we, uh, the, the project is organizing together with APEX uh, an online course that uh, it's uh, lasting from September to December this year. We also attend workshops so where we can uh, interact with the stakeholders face to face, which is also very useful. And we are also uh, part of the EU Arctic Cluster, which is a network of uh, European funded projects that uh, do research in the Arctic. And uh, in this sense, uh, because the, um, the cluster has a group devoted to user engagement, this is very interesting for us because the, the user engagement activities in the different projects uh, in the cluster are kind of uh, coordinated together. And finally, uh, in user engagement, we also develop case studies, and actually these case studies are the, are the main topic of this presentation. Uh, more and more in the media, we, we see pieces of news like this one. Uh, that states that uh, the Arctic uh, loss of sea ice is connected to changes in Europe and in mid latitudes. And this uh, is a piece of news that appeared two weeks ago. Uh, and is an interview to Ivana Zijanovic, uh, who is a, research, uh, a researcher at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And uh, she mentions that even if these changes are quite under, uh, understood nowadays by the scientific community, the political reaction still seems weak. And uh, there, there may be different reasons for that, but one of them is maybe that we need to better communicate this kind of, of issues. And one way to communicate these issues are to case studies. 
And as Carla already mentioned in, in her presentation before, uh, case studies are past events of relevance for stakeholders. So stakeholders really remember about them because they affected their businesses. They are useful to showcase the, the, the utility of weather, climate, and sea ice prediction because uh, stakeholders can understand how the information would have been useful if available at the moment of the event. They are very, um, uh, very good to illustrate how we move from model outcomes to decision making. And finally, as Carla mentioned, they allow us to identify the research gap and where research needs to focus in the future. Uh, the, the application of the study that I'm going to present is about energy. And it's an event uh, that occurred in winter 2016-2017. And it was identified in the s 2 s 4 project as, as relevant for stakeholders in the energy sector. It is uh, a joint effort between climate scientists, of course, but also social scientists and science communication specialists, which take part in the consortium of the applicant project, and as I have mentioned, in collaboration with the S2S40 project. And we believe that this case study could provide some insights for policymakers, but also for some uh, energy stakeholders, such as big energy associations, global networks of transmission system operators, and maybe others that we are not considering now. Uh, I'm going to describe now quite briefly the, the case study, but uh, I will start presenting you a chain of events that we have identified for this case study, which starts with a historical low of winter sea ice concentration in a region of the Arctic called Barents and Karachis. Then uh, this, uh, this historical low of sea ice was followed by a cold spell that affected Europe, many parts of Europe. And uh, this, uh, in turn, affected the, the energy demand and also the, su the supply. Uh, let's start by the first event in the chain, which is the historical low of sea ice concentration in the Barents and the Karasis. And in the graph on the, on the left, you can see the, the concentration of sea ice anomalies for November December, and December 2016. Uh, this relative to the, to the historical average for the year 1980, to 2015. And you, uh, in red, you can see this square, which uh, is indicating where the region, the, the Barents and Karasi region is. And then uh, what we can see in this graph is that the darker the blue color is, the lower uh, the sea ice concentration is compared to the historical average. On the graph, uh, in the graph on the, on the right, you can see the, the anomalies for total precipitation. And uh, this graph shows that uh, the, um, the darker the orange color is, the lower the, the precipitation is. So we can see that in Europe, precipitation was extremely low for December 2016. The second uh, event in the chain is the cold spell that affected Europe. And this cold spell occurred together with the lowest total precipitation since 1901 and the least windy winter months of the last three decades. In these uh, images, you can see the, the anomalies in temperature, precipi uh, sorry, surface wind and precipitation for the third week of January 2019. And uh, you can see, for example, that in the region uh, uh, of France, the temperatures were extremely low and uh, surface wind and precipitation were also low. This, uh, yeah, this generated uh, an increase in the energy demand in France and also lower than usual hydropower and wind power generation. So uh, in France, this increase of the demand was very important because most of the domestic heating systems fit on electricity, and they experienced on the, on the 20th of January, they experienced a peak in, energy, in electricity consumption that was the third highest peak ever recorded in France. And because this cold spell occurred together with a nuclear shutdown in France, then the, there was an energy security risk and uh, restrictions needed to be implemented and also energy needed to be uh, imported from neighboring countries. We can see in this graph that uh, uh, in normal conditions, the, the, demand, uh, the demand of electricity in France is around 85 gigawatts in January, but uh, for this specific event, it, uh, it corresponded to a once in 10 year post spell. So it was something that was important. So to finish, the outcomes of this case study are that it suggests that the high reduction of Arctic sea ice has favored a record breaking low precipitation and wind speed 
over parts of Western Europe. Uh, this case study, with this case study, applicant contributes to understand the linkages between the Arctic and the latitude. And finally, once these linkages are better understood, uh, future forecasts of extremely low sea ice extent that, as we have shown, shown uh, are related to, to forecasts of electricity demand and supply, could be potentially valuable for adaptation and for assessing the risk for the European energy system. If you are interested in this case study, you can download it in the Applicate website. And uh, we are thinking now in uh, the upcoming case studies that we can develop. And the next ones will be for heat waves related to fires, for rain and snow events related to landslides. We are thinking about a policy brief about the optimal locations to describe variability in Arctic sea ice. And then there are two different topics that we would be interested in, but we haven't started any case studies yet, but they are influenced and by labor. And that's it. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Marta. So, does anybody have uh, any specific questions? We have a couple of minutes before we go to the next speaker. Okay. So, if you have any, uh, don't be just think about. You can mute yourself, and uh, if not. Then uh, we will go to the next speaker, Gemma. And I hope later in the, in the institution we will have time to come and pull your together. So the next speaker is uh, Gerda Kovic. She's social scientist in the Earth Science Department at PSC. Gemma has a background with 15 years of experience in working on decision support for global environmental change. And uh, she will be presenting a uh, case study developed in the Primavera project. So we'll go ahead, Jagger. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. I will share the screen then. Yeah? Okay. Yes, yeah, so this third uh, example is uh -huh, sorry, yeah. It's very different from what we had from Express Query or from Applicate, and and as you will see in a moment why. So let me first just briefly introduce the Primavera project. It is another European nation that is on this project and it is about designing and running high resolution global climate models. Uh, this state of the art climate model simulation will go up to 25 kilometers and for some model groups, modeling groups even higher, which is um, quite a novelty in the global climate modeling. And uh, these simulations will be for uh, city sticks and all the, all the latest experiments that are looking at the global scale. With this high resolution, we expect to provide a simulation of certain climate processes, for example, heat waves, or floods, or droughts, by better resolving some of the underlying physical processes. We also expect that these models could show us better some small scale atmospheric or oceanic phenomena, for example, tropical cyclones or ocean eddies, and, or on the other hand, large scale phenomena with very localized effects. So the effects, for example, precipitation related to storms, tropical origin. So as you can see, some of these uh, events can have very strong impact on the society and different businesses. So this information could be really very important for, for the society as a whole. And you can see on this image one example of how, what, what uh, high resolution uh, representing ocean surface current, how it's different. Uh, when we move from on the left side very high resolution to more coarse resolution on the right. The Primavera Consortium is, is, is big, it's 19 institutions, and some of them are leading European researchers working on, on climate change, climate modeling, and also climate computing. And then there is us, it's a team that works on user engagement and dissemination, and we also have a team who closely collaborates with us and works on impact analysis. The idea on this team where I arrived um, was to see how we can use this new data and combine it with the stakeholders' knowledge and test it practically. So what we wanted to do could be would be called we wanted to co-produce knowledge. And knowledge co-production is, is a very common uh, term nowadays in the climate services community and discourses. Still, there is no broadly accepted understanding of what we mean by, by co-production, and often we use it in the context of achieving greater quality um, or usability, for example, of the, of the kind of services that we are uh, producing. 
Still, we, we could go broader and have a bit less restricted understanding of the term co-production. And I like this uh, definition in particular, which says that co-production is a complex meeting place where several different academic traditions, but also different practices, converge, overlap, affect each other, sometimes come into conflict, and hopefully mostly cooperate. And given the very technical nature of the, of the Primavera project, and uh, the fact that the results are very scientific, highly specialized, that there is still high uncertainty, and, and we are still uh, missing kind of consensus about the added value of high resolution. And our team on, on user engagement and dissemination has a very challenging task of how to motivate different stakeholders to collaborate with us. And uh, so we needed to be very creative and, and innovative and make one, one new avenue of these participatory activities. And that could be described with this framework. So what we did, we were, we were communicating about what we are doing in Primavera project through trying to uh, raise awareness to different engagement activities. Then we were also exchanging knowledge and involving stakeholders in that way. For example, we were, we were wondering what was the most important impact that are affecting different sectors, what the current use of climate data, what is still missing. And finally, we were really trying to uncover the sciences and so that they can test what they are doing, how it really and whether it has any uh, any implication in the real life, and also our, our champion users uh, who could apply this very knowledge data. So that could be uh, called co-production. And to, in all these three realms, we were using different uh, communication channels, participatory approaches, and participatory tools. So for example, we started by providing different communication materials, and then we did a survey. Uh, in survey, we recognized certain participants who were willing to continue collaborating with us, so we took every many minutes so this communication became more fluent. And then we developed a user interface platform that I would like to encourage you to visit. And we did interviews that are more profound to really understand what are the main troubles uh, related to climate that, are, that the stakeholders are dealing with. And then we finally developed case studies. We continued this involvement through things like webinars, like this one, or meet workshops, and maybe social media. So we see that this approach is dynamic, iterative, and not linear. It's more cyclic, and we are moving in an iterative way from one to the between these three realms. And then I'll focus on one of the case studies that we developed. And I already mentioned that the, that the results of this project are very technical, so, and it was not something like a narrative developed in Africate or where it were necessary, very heavy user as a partner, but we really needed to find an external partner who has the capacity to, to work with such a, such a complex and, and a very specialized type of information. And so one of the what we call champion users is from Poirier, Austria. Uh, Poirier is an engineering consultancy working in power field, including hydropower. And they already do hydrological and hydropower impact research in upper Danube basin. And, and they do this to both inform their own work and the work of their company, but also to inform other institutions, for, institutions, for example, German Federal Institute of Hydrology, or Austrian Climate and Energy Fund, and some different uh, ministries. So, Poli is not a typical end user, more as an intermediary user, while end users here would be like water managers, different water bodies, or energy clients. Um, they focus on the Danube Basin because it's a very important waterway. Uh, it includes different natural substances. Generally, the use of water from Danube is multifaceted. And uh, among others, it includes also a lot of hydropower generation. And the objective of this first uh, assessment that was done uh, was to evaluate the skill of the results of the Primavera Global Climate Model and the different spatial resolution and to see how they can represent the regional climate at the scale of upper Danube hydrological models. And also the, the idea was to compare how these results um, uh, behave comparing to results obtained by, by different data that, that our champions normally use. As I said, they are already conducting impact research in upper Danube, and they have a monthly conceptual water balance model. And in the this model, they normally use the regional climate data and samples and project data. And they have very long uh, very long both records 
and long historical simulations already conducted um, going back to the, mid, uh, to the end of the um, 19th century. So, um, how they use Primavera data? Uh, in this initial assessment, they use six different realizations of one of the seven uh, global climate models that are, um, that are working, that are being applied in Primavera, and both for post and coupled version of this model, and in three uh, different horizontal resolutions from 100 kilometers over 50 to 25 kilometers, which you consider high resolution. And, and they use they wanted to see historical means of precipitation and temperature uh, and to compare them with observational data sets over the entire academic basin. And so um, because they use monthly um, monthly data, uh, it's interesting to see that uh, in this case we're not really testing the high uh, temporal resolution, which is also one of the products of, of Primavera, but we're more interested to see how different uh, space aspects of high resolution affect the results. And, and we see that uh, monthly mean and average for the whole basin, that is these two figures, they, they show quite a good results and better than regional modeling, and particularly in the case of temperature. So the, the pink and, and dot color, pink color and black dot, they show observation data and other color, other colors that, and, and results from uh, Primavera models with different resolution. And, and they see that the results are rather, rather similar. While in the case of precipitation, the spread is a bit broader, but also relatively good. And, but now let's look at the more space from the space uh, from the geographic from the spatial view, and we can see a lot of differences and different biases. So in the case of precipitation, there is something that we can call a wet bias in the north of the region. This is green, so the green means that it's going that is uh, showing uh, higher precipitation than than what of the relationship. And then on the on the south, which is um, Alpine region, we can have uh, we, we can have we have something that we call um, dry bias, so showing less precipitation than observation. I need to, to emphasize that, that in this this case, concrete case studies, when we start working on it, in the Primavera project, we still did not have future runs because there were certain delays related to the uh, new climate forcing that they haven't been issued at time. So this is only historical data. And on the right side, we have uh, the results for temperature. And just to take a precipitation, we can see that this bias is improving, actually becoming smaller with higher resolution, particularly here in the case of the couple of high, uh, high resolution modeling. While in the case of temperature, we also see bias. And it's to some extent improving with high resolution, but still there is this um, cold, cold spot in the Alpine region, which is most probably related to uh, although the results were accurate to the basic level, but uh, because of very complex topography in the Alps, probably that scale did uh, work totally well. So the, some of the findings so far are that high resolution global climate models show less lower bias in temperature and precipitation over this particular region, comparing to uh, lower resolution. So we, we, we show how, how our own results in Primavera behave. And, and for example, we saw some, some of the areas related to temperature bias, uh, which is more, most uh, probably related to this um, topography uh, and problem with dense scaling. And this is just one part of the, of the case study. The, this uh, POIR is co continuing to collaborate with us, particularly through collaboration with the University of Reading, who are, are providing data to them, and they're, they're part of the Primavera team, particularly interested in, in impact analysis. And so they will, they will continue this collaboration. Uh, in the future, they are planning to include more uh, more Primavera data so to consider also other other models to see how they behave, how they, they uh, show results, and and also to do climate change impact scenarios for discharge and hydro power production venue based on this high resolution data. And when we when we start to find these future scenarios. And it will be very useful for better understanding of what we can expect in the future, both when it comes to energy demand, for example, temperature could be a proxy for that, but also energy production uh, related to, for example, precipitation, what we can, how, how much of the hydropower we can expect in the future. And the Danny region is a well-researched region, so there is already a lot of work being done. 
But if you manage to show that this high resolution is consistent or even better than in uh, regional high resolution modeling, then we can be more confident using in some other regions that have less uh, research. And just some very brief final reflections on the whole process. And we experience the co-production is an intensive and very time consuming process. Also finding champion users, uh, in this case, that are external to the project is, is not easy. And we should keep in mind that we as scientists do the moment this work as a living while these most of our users are actually doing that voluntary and uh, pro bono basis and practical in their free time. So they need to find a way how to combine it with their everyday work. Uh, also, given the very uh, technical nature and very uh, specialized nature of the, the primary result, we need to find users who, who have capacity to, to deal with this type of data. And uh, finally, relationship building in general in climate service is a lot in process, so having case studies that can, can help really maintain this relationship. And just for the end to say that um, it's not only the knowledge of a uh, highly specialized users that we should consider, as is the case in this Primavera case study that I, I described, but we should also uh, consider the different community epistemologies, uh, that is, we should dismantle the term user and ground the heterogeneity of stakeholders and no different knowledge they can provide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gagaman. Um, I think I would go back to this last slide, just one second. Because this brings, uh, as long as uh, I don't see any questions from the from the audience, uh, please, uh, if you have any specific questions, uh, you can ask either unmute or just write your name in the chat, so I will give you the floor to talk if you have any specific questions. So at any moment, please write your name in the chat, so uh, I will give you time to enter into the discussion. Uh, so I had a broad question. I mean, Jaira was making some reflections about uh, the process, and then I wanted to ask, for example, Marta, Marta Tirado, in, in for applicate project. Which was your experience? I mean, which was the challenge or the difficulty? Or was you found more difficult on the creation of the case study? Uh, well, in in general, the major difficulty that we have is to identify this case study. Because uh, one thing is the output of the project, but then you need to somehow think about them in, uh, and look at them with different eyes, you know, and, and, and see uh, what, can, what really can be communicated to users. And then once you communicate to them, what's the, what's the reaction and, and what can be the next? So the, the most difficult, I think, is this, to, to break this barrier from the science to something useful to the users. I have to say that these case studies in particular that I presented didn't do this user engagement work because it was actually a first for it. So it was not applicate, but we we try to do uh, in applicate we, we are trying also to do to develop other case studies in which we have to interact with users. And apart from what I already mentioned, a second a second issue that we have identified is that the project should plan much more in advance sometimes uh, for for this type of user engagement. So if I mean if you want to develop a lot of studies, you need to be flexible enough. And, you know, to flexible enough to adapt uh, to these uh, requirements of users, which are not always static. They change, for example, or they appear new new requirements appear. And sometimes the difficulty has been to accommodate this is for the user, and it's not only in this sense. Thank you very much. So, did somebody that wants to say anything? Uh, so somebody unmuting the microphone? No? So, I think this thing to work with, with SOS3. As you said, uh, you were collaborating, the secret were collaborating in the state study. Mm -hmm. And so, I want to ask, uh, okay, so do you want to know to have um, to have the users in the project, so they were up in there. Uh, which was the main challenge for you in the project? Uh, well, yes, that that. Um, as you said, that's the particularity of the S2S3 project because we are uh, doing this project in co-production. I like that that word uh, with users, with the people that will be using and uh, in some in 
some way with the people that will be purchasing the product. So these are uh, use, these are com companies, private companies that have their own uh, information, their own data, that it's private. So we had to have confidentiality of this information, and it's very difficult because we have to match uh, all the information that is public, make with this uh, confidential information and treat the information somehow that we can share results without having uh, confidentiality issues. It's a challenge because uh, we cannot have uh, names, numbers, uh, this kind of sensitive information. So I think that's uh, one, one big challenge. Also, the difference in, in profiles. Sometimes when you have a, when you are in a project, you work with uh, technology, technology or research entities. But when you are working with also with the industry, they have another mindset, maybe from business or something different. So it's very it's a challenge to to switch your mindset to put your hat of research and then put the hat and the industry and to to have this uh, in online you know so i think that's the two main challenges in the, in the project but um what we saw is that if you work uh, not 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 just once but uh, if you could develop in you have different sessions or along the, the time you can overcome these challenges okay thank you very much carla and uh, i had another question in the lack of uh, of commercial discussion uh for uh, Dragana and in the in the context of primavera uh, how do you see where do you see the main value of having this case to study and uh, which is the main value for the project of thinking and giving time, space, and, and money and dedication to make to build this business? In, in this particular case, we are working with this very specialized and they cannot really grow the and also it's, it's huge, um, just um, you just need a uh, very uh, high um, computational power even so that it is so it's not something that we can easily disseminate. And what they found particular, what they really liked was that in the workshops we usually have a few other scientists who are trying to show because it's very new information. So they are trying to show, they show what they found very static value. For example, we found that uh, for soil drought, it's, it's very important. It's much better information if they have global patterns or high resolution and regional information because there are certain um, global patterns that can be even influence. And in one of these workshops, they usually have a scientist who are presenting it. We, we also invited this champion user, um, and then it was really, I think, good motivation for the participants to see that someone who is external to the project, who is, who is working in the business sector, can also use it, and, and who also found uh, important in, in what they are producing. Thank you. So I think I'm going to make a last question, and then we will be talking about it. So the question is for Martha. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, how was your experience uh, in your experience? I mean, I see for the speakers that we have here, we don't have a kind of scientist. We have <laughs> very different profiles working together with kind of scientists. So how was your experience with the involvement of the uh, kind of scientists in the creation of the people's study? How it was? Well, it was, it was good. It was great, I would say, because uh, we have the chance that at least the, the scientists that were involved were very motivated. So, because I, I guess they are used, they are normally uh, working in the science itself without thinking too much about the, the, the application of the science. And once you give them the opportunity to get involved in a real application, they get excited. So it was good. And then from the other side, because they were willing to collaborate, they were kind of teaching us. So the things that, uh, the, there were many things that I was assuming at the beginning. And that I realized I was not understanding that well. And this is, from this interaction, what I like the most is that I think that both sides will have this. So I would value it in a very, very positive way. That's great. <laughs> so we had a comment from one of the activists on the had to do this. Um, but one of the comments was that they were interested in which uh, 
uh, has been presented and also the need of connecting. Uh, so I want to to remember everybody here, kind of curious is exactly uh, coordination to support action, specifically to connect people um, all around kind of services and from the different services. So of course, uh, we will be sharing everything and uh, this is the best network possible to really interact and keep in touch with all the people who engage with this panel. For the scientific perspective, for the economic perspective, for the commercial ones, there are different ways of doing business studies. We have seen three different uh, points of business studies in this, uh, in, in this webinar, and I hope that uh, it has been interesting. Does any speaker have any final remarks, something that you would like to highlight? So then uh, it's time to finish and close the, the webinar. Uh, so please, I just want to remind you that the recording of the meeting will be uploaded to the Canada Europe website. Uh, so you have the, the URL there. Uh, sorry, I didn't come to know that. Yeah, the last thing I'm going to so just let me wait for one second. <laughs> Okay, so the question is from Azula from uh, uh, from Tati, and then the question is that uh, from kind of modeling, is there uh, some kind of modeling on the ISO of the energy transmission line? Uh, yeah, this is I don't know if uh, I understand you correctly, but is it that uh, the energy transmission line gets frozen? Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, I guess uh, maybe there are some projects that are starting this uh, in Africa not specifically, but it's true that this webinar, that, I, that this online course that I mentioned before in my presentation, uh, in this, this online course is addressed to, to every, every career scientist. But uh, we wanted to, to give also them the possibility to get engaged in case studies, so one of the case studies were offering them, are related to energy problems. So even though we have nothing right now, it might be that some students would work in something. I, I'm not sure it's exactly what Abdullah is mentioning, but it's all these problems that the freezing is causing in the transmission line. So maybe in the future. That's fine. Then I can also tell you from this with for a project uh, it's more on the maintenance side, not so much on the transmission, but uh, there have been some cases studies also devoted to a particular extreme event in Romania that had some ice problems in the cables. But it was also a bit more on the the access to the to the assets in order to avoid the problem. Uh, you will find the information of the four projects available in, in the website and then all the information uh, will be even in the recordings of the webinar, so just please take the take the chance to, to broaden the network. So thank you very much. And uh, just final remark, then uh, just to let you know this is a series of webinars, so there will be more announcements for more webinars. Thank you very much for everybody for your time and your attention. <laughs>